I'm Phil Hill, and this is Michael Feldstein. And welcome back to eLiterate TV. At the MOOC Research Initiative Conference in Texas this past December, we had the opportunity to crowdsource some answers to five popular MOOC questions. Now this video is longer than we typically do, but if you look at the Telling Story Player table of contents, you can select which questions are of most interest to you. Or if you're watching on YouTube, you can scrub through the video to find out where different sections start. And now, let's watch the film. Hi, welcome back to eLiterate TV. I'm Michael Feldstein, and this is Phil Hill. So often when conversation about MOOCs comes to campus, it goes something like this. The dean or provost or president might uh, walk out of a, a meeting with a, one of the big MOOC providers and say to campus, we're doing a MOOC. A faculty member might pipe up and say, well, I, I hear that MOOCs give you cancer. We're trying to help smart people on campuses have smarter conversations. So what we're going to do is ask five questions of, of the audience here today. Simple questions that you might get from somebody on campus who's heard about MOOCs, is interested in MOOCs, but hasn't spent their day and their career studying MOOCs, engaged with MOOCs, thinking about MOOCs. Number one, what is a MOOC? Number two, uh, are MOOCs effective for teaching? Number three, I don't teach online. Why should I care about MOOCs? Number four, I hear we are doing a MOOC what should I be concerned about? And finally, what does it take to do a MOOC or to make a MOOC? What we're looking for is a, is a provocative answer, one that is uh, truthful to what you think, but it invites the person at whatever level of knowledge and interest that they have into a conversation to think just a little bit more than they've been thinking about MOOCs so far. Let's start with the first question. What is a MOOC? Yes, I'm Jim Groom, the Director of Teaching and Learning Technologies at the University of Mary Washington. And in answer to your question, what is a MOOC, the kind of acronym, just to kind of break that, Massive Open Online Course. A MOOC is a way to reimagine how online learning can bring the audience that you're kind of establishing at your university well beyond it. So to create an international potential audience, there's the two camps of MOOCs. There's what's called the X MOOC, which are these kind of corporate platforms for these massive open online where you actually take the work you're doing at university and run it through them. So it's like a third party service for your course. And then there's these connectivist MOOCs, which can actually possibly outsource. Uh, but these are MOOCs that oftentimes are more organic to your community. So I think the thing that I focus on with the MOOC is the, the openness part of it and what that means. And I think the, the first thing is that it's, it's a very limited kind of openness. The crucial openness of a MOOC is open enrollment. So the idea is that anybody can join, anybody can participate. And the basic, the basic idea behind it, as far as I understand it, is that the way that most instruction happens is communicating material to your students. And there's a lot of this that you can do online. And so if you can do all that online, why not open it up to as many people as possible? Because it, it's not harder. Once you do a good presentation of your material, it's not harder to, to scale it out to anybody who wants to view it. And so you open the doors on that. Um, and so this has become a way to let people into to thinking about how they might restructure their material online. But it's really about taking that stuff and just trying to open it up to participation. When I think about MOOCs, I think about them really in two ways. The first is, I think MOOCs are the natural evolution of online courses. Uh, when I was at the University of Oklahoma about 10 years ago, when we talked about online courses, there were really analogs for just what happened in the classroom. You had about 25 students in your online course, you had about 25 students in your, and so there wasn't much difference. MOOCs are that next evolution, they're about scale. They're about saying, Forget the traditional classroom to some extent. How can we really do this online? And that's why they're messy, I think, and that's why they're a little organic and growing out of control in ways that we can't quite control because we don't know the answers to that. We haven't had a thousand years of doing it this way. We're still trying. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is I think MOOCs or MOOC in general is a brand. I think MOOC today and in the near future is probably the brand for online learning in general. And I think that's why it's really important, because without the brand, we can't grow. And we know that makes it online teaching and learning in general a product, and I think that's why it's going to have a big impact. Great. Thank you. 
Uh, my name is Stacy Zemke, and I'm the Open Educational Resource Coordinator at the University of Oklahoma Libraries. And I think MOOCs are important to me, and where they have sort of changed my life lately is bringing back the conversation about open and open resources. There's a lot of question about how a MOOC is open and what part of a MOOC are open, but I do think that it's, it's exciting to me because it's made people think again about where does content come from, how is it packaged, and how is it used, and how can it be reused? And I don't think we have great answers to those yet, but I think that at least we're talking about those things again. And that gets people thinking about where am I getting content so that I can actually use it in different ways, use it in open ways, use it in electronic ways, use it online. So I think that there's promise there, and I think that that part about it is really exciting. OK. Well, thank you. OK, so question number two. Are MOOCs effective for teaching? Let's hear what folks have to say. Define effective teaching. <laughs> do they help? Do they I, help? That may students? be good. I like that. Yeah, that <laughs> might be. The same. <laughs> oh, it's an excellent question. So, what is effective teaching? I guess in the context of the question, we're looking at is this a form that is actually valuable to convey information and to help learners learn? Well, well actually, let, let's let's put this in your context. So, um, imagine you're having this conversation with someone specific on your campus. What do you think that specific person would think of as effective teaching, and how would you respond to them? Right. I, I think this is a question that I've been answering for a long time because I've been teaching online for a long time, not in MOOCs, but in traditional caged, you know, LMS courses. Um, so not in the not free range. Everybody says, well, how do you know they're learning? How do you know what they're doing? How do you know that you're teaching when you're teaching online? And it is different, um, and you have to adapt to that as an instructor. But I also want to turn the question around and say, is it a good place to learn? And I think MOOCs are a great place to learn because information is there, content is there, and people are getting content from all these other places anyway. And this is just structured content. Are they learning what I want them to learn? I don't know. Are they learning what I'm teaching? hard to say. But is there learning? Is there an information flow? Is there knowledge creation? Is there knowledge sharing? Yes. And those are the questions I started to ask myself about my online teaching. Is that there? Is that happening? And thought about what I was trying to achieve in the classroom with discussions and with interaction and change those. I had to change the structure, but I think getting to the point where people were sharing information was all I wanted them to do. I know a lot of people say, how do you know what they're doing? How do you know what they're sharing? I know more about what they're sharing in an online course because I can read what they're saying. When I've got eight groups in a classroom, I have no idea what those people are talking about. I'm assuming they're picking the best place for beer. And I'm assuming these people are figuring out how to cheat on their chemistry homework. But <laughs> I really don't know what they're doing. I have more sense of, I think, what their reflection is and what they're gaining online sometimes. Now MOOCs take away that ability to watch what everyone is doing. But are we the mother hen? Are we, what does it mean to teach? Do you guide everyone by hand and make sure everybody gets the same thing? Or do you sort of present them and let them build the knowledge that they sure. need? For me, it's two things. MOOCs, I think, are really valuable for actually faculty learning and interrogating the space and the networked possibilities for teaching and learning. And I think what the MOOCs bring to the table is a kind of refocused idea about pedagogy and what that means online. And I think for that, they've been invaluable. The idea of the original MOOC, right, the old gold, the original gangster MOOC with uh, Stephen Downs and uh, George Siemens had this idea that the MOOC itself was a possibility to demonstrate a philosophy or a theory about connectivist learning. And I think the MOOC, even if it's just one experience amongst many that you have as part of your career as a student in higher ed, is invaluable to start understanding how you navigate these networks and how networks changes the possibility for learning, not only as a student, but beyond. So I think in that way, um, it is crucial to the teaching and learning premise, but not just for the student, also for the professor, and also for what it means as we move forward, um, how networks and the web more generally will affect the practice and the possibilities of what we're doing. So sort of a meta-learning is what we're getting into. Yeah, I mean, almost like a metaverse of learning, right? Like, I mean, you have a whole new kind of universe with which you can inhabit, right? I mean, it's as if Wolverine and, um, you know, Daredevil are real almost, right? And those possibilities you could only imagine before in comic books are actually a possibility. Like, you can, for example, teach an online course as a character. I mean, that's a, that's a kind of fascinating fact. I don't know if it's ethical, 
But it's interesting, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, so yeah. I mean, I think for that, the possibilities it arounds, and I just hate that the narrative sometimes become ossified uh, with the us versus them, or it's going to disrupt everything, or change everything, or dis disrupt everything. But I also think some of the issues you hear earlier that are really important is, what does this mean for labor? What does this mean for the adjunct army, which is just growing? How does this inform a kind of maybe, hopefully, uh, a more informed dissent about certain kind of unilateral decisions administrations making about this? So, I mean, it brings up a lot of issues. And I think for anything, it's brought these issues to the fore for us to really think about um, in some intelligent ways, hopefully, which is why I appreciate you guys doing this. Sure, thank you. Thanks. If your learning objective, or really your, your teaching objective, if you're a professor, is to convey content to students, and you can certainly get that kind of content from any kind of MOOC. Uh, but, but if you have a teaching objective or a learning objective that involves learning sort of higher end skills that depend on interaction, then it becomes increasingly questionable. And really the structure of your MOOC is gonna depend on how effective that is. So I think the most important thing to do is if you're really concerned about learning is to ask more questions about what the MOOC that you might be getting is gonna look like. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I don't like the, the premise of the question. I, I, don't, I don't think a MOOC itself is a complete experience. I think a MOOC is an input. And so the right question to ask is, what is the effective input that can complement the sort of learning experience you're trying to create? And so MOOCs can certainly be effective for um, communicating content, sharing the content around. They can do a little bit more than that. They do some level of interaction when you're, when you're asked to respond to questions about the content you just viewed, or there may be some discussion forums. But I think if you're looking at the whole experience that you're trying to create, MOOCs are probably going to be a supplement and a complement to that, so not the entire thing. And so if you're trying to ask, will MOOCs do everything for you, the answer is no. But they could be a valuable part of something bigger that you're doing. Right. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think it kind of begs a little bit of a, maybe a broader question. I, I like the question. I wonder if the question isn't also are MOOCs uh, appropriate and useful and valuable for learning? Um, we tend to think of it in a, maybe a corporate sense from an institutional perspective, and we have to work within those structures and say, well, I need to recruit faculty, and faculty have objectives, faculty have things they have to accomplish in order to be successful within the overall institutional environment, whether I'm a tenured or non-tenured faculty member. But I think there are other issues there, and I think this is where the exciting part is. Are MOOCs a way to introduce and foster and facilitate better types of learning? You know, technology is pretty much anything more than a, dirt in the, uh, a stick in the sand, right? That's what technology is. And so when we talk about is technology valuable or MOOCs valuable for teaching, we say, can they help us get to where we really want to go? We live in an artificial environment. We work in an artificial centripetal model where everybody comes to this artificial place for us to teach them artificial things. But can MOOCs represent more than that? And can we really scale learning the way that it really happens naturally? I think that's the question, and I think they do offer promise. I don't teach online. Why should I care about MOOCs? Well, imagine if you held a class and nobody showed up. Where have they gone? Well, they might be taking a MOOC. Uh, they might be taking that MOOC for credit. Your face-to-face -face students could conceivably all be migrating online and making it very difficult for you to do your job. Now, I'm not saying this is necessarily going to happen, but this becomes a possibility when large, well-known universities are extending their brands into your market. I teach at a public school. It's a regional university. We will never be producing a MOOC, I can pretty much guarantee you that, but there's a chance that our students might want credit for taking that MOOC. And if that happens, that's gonna create less demand for faculty on my campus, and if you're in a situation similar to me, it's possible it might be happening to you as well. Yeah, so I think what's been happening so far is that most of the movement has been coming from the administration. Um, it's been coming from the, the, the political power bases trying to figure out how to basically deal with shrinking state budgets, how to deal with revenue streams. And so the danger is that these things are going to happen um, for you if you're not participating in what's going on. And so I think trying to get the pedagogical issues out front and driving the conversation is a crucial part of making this not just be driven by the administration's concern about managing its own budgets. And so if you're not part of that, you're not going to be an effective part of the conversation. Well, I think we should care about MOOCs because MOOCs are about the theory of learning. 
So it really doesn't matter. It's not an online thing. I mean, we have the online piece, but MOOCs are about more than that. And I think um, some of the discussion that's been about learning and teaching, but networks, et cetera, what we're really saying is how, what are the ways that people can learn effectively? And MOOCs talk about that. Can we learn at scale? Can we learn, how much can we really learn from our peers? And how structured does that need to be? And do we need feedback loops? And we bring in complexity theory and things like that. And that applies just as much to the classroom, the physical brick and mortar classroom as it does to any technology online, et cetera. And so MOOCs are a way for to help us really extend the conversation about learning, which quite honestly gets pretty stagnant and has been for a long time. And I think MOOCs are kind of a next step to revolutionary, revolutionizing some of the dialogue. So what I hear you saying is that um, MOOCs break all of the things that we thought were rules and forces us to figure out what the rules really are. Yes, they force inquiry. And whether we agree or disagree on the online part or the scale, they make us reevaluate and reflect on the things that got us into this to begin with, and that's always valuable. I hear we're doing a MOOC. What should I be concerned about? Well, define doing. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, you probably can define doing. You know, you're gonna produce a MOOC, but I imagine that faculty members out there hear that MOOCs are coming to town and they might not necessarily know what that means. Are you producing a MOOC? Are you consuming a MOOC? Are you producing and consuming your own MOOC? These are the questions that you really need to make absolutely certain uh, that you understand the answers to because then you can respond to them thoughtfully. Uh, if you're producing a MOOC, then there are questions about how to create the lectures, how the class is gonna be structured. If you're going to consume your own MOOC, which is essentially flipping your own classroom, you have to ask and think about how your students are gonna be viewing it, where you're gonna put it, what the formats are gonna be. Uh, but if you're at a university that's only consuming a MOOC, then you have to ask who wants to consume a MOOC. Um, you have to ask what courses is this MOOC suitable for. You have to ask what the license agreement is with the MOOC provider so that you know whether or not your university is paying too much for a product that you don't need or maybe you're taking advantage of a product that everybody wants and getting a really good deal for it. And then you probably have nothing to worry about. But the key thing to do is to ask questions. I think first and foremost, you're concerned about time. I found um, teaching a particular form of uh, a MOOC, it took a tremendous amount of time and energy, planning. The thing about an online course is, not only do you have to plan almost the whole course before the semester starts, you also have a lot of people looking at the stuff you've done, institutionally and beyond. So if you're gonna do one, Take a entire six months, plan with it. Meet with your educational technology folks, meet with your videographers, get that stuff done early on. The other thing is if you're doing a MOOC, be in social network spaces. Be in places like Twitter, be in places like Facebook, wherever, where you can connect with these students in different ways. Just to kind of be a figurehead and someone who's sitting on top of a talking head on the TV screen, I think is not enough to engage. And however you do it through whatever platform, understand that you don't have to read everything. You don't have to kind of you know, inhabit the entire stream of information. You can just guide people and randomly give encouragement. Um, and really think about it if you're doing one for, for the first time, ask yourself why you're doing it. Why are you doing it? Um, and I think that's the biggest question. And if you have an answer, like we've heard of some of the discussion today, because that you want to think about this new space, you want to interrogate it, you want to kind of analyze what it means for your teaching. And the best thing I've heard is like really kind of taking stock of what this means for a larger philosophy of professorship, a larger philosophy of what it means to be a student, and who we are in this space. And I think if you think about that critically, there's no better kind of place to do it. But you have to ask your question, you know, how much time and energy are you getting support from your institution? Do you have a course release maybe for something else so you can actually imagine this in some real way? And I think that's important institutionally. So, Well, there are obviously a lot of things you could be concerned about. Uh, I'm going to eliminate three that have surfaced and that surface quite often in our conversations at Stanford just because they're ones I'm pretty familiar with. One is uh, intellectual property. So the minute that you have a course that you're putting out publicly, there are questions about who owns the course, who owns component pieces of the course, if it's part of a MOOC, does it belong to the university, does it belong to the professor, can somebody go sell it, can another university reuse it, and what are the guidelines around that? So intellectual property is something that comes up quite often 
uh, in our conversations about MOOCs. Another is accessibility. So we have guidelines and responsibilities to our enrolled students quite often, uh, or, or always, around accessibility. But the question about accessibility related to public students is kind of out in the open. We don't really have clear gu guidelines about what accessibility uh, sh uh, guidelines we have for public students. And so, you know, Stanford's taken a, a strong stance that we treat the accessibility concerns the same way we treat for our own students, that we want to make sure that all the materials that we put out are accessible by various populations. Um, but th that's a question that a lot of universities have to grapple with because that's also a really expensive proposition to deal with. The third, I would say, and, and this kind of reflects Jim, Jim's comment, is that um, time is a big issue, and the support that faculty have in order to do what they need to do. Uh, that's a really big concern, especially if your university has not had a history of doing online learning on its campus. There might not be a great support unit to help faculty and help TAs and help all the other people involved in this endeavor to actually be successful in what they're doing. We have high expectations for MOOCs. You know, MOOCs should look like this, and they should promote learning and do all these things, but if we don't have good support units in place for faculty to do that, you know, it's going to be a problematic endeavor. So making sure that you have instructional designers, instructional technologists, people who have a history of understanding how to do online learning, uh, bring those people to bear in the conversation I think is really important early on. I'll illuminate one more that just came to me. Copyright is a really big issue. You know, we've, we've worked, we've operated very much under the, um, the protection of the Fair, Fair Use Act, the, the TEACH Act, um, for courses that are on campus it's, even, even if they're online, they have a, a login that you can then kind of put things behind that are maybe copyrighted materials. That, the rules of that change when it becomes a public course. And so, again, helping faculty to navigate the, the intricacies of copyright law or helping them to push beyond and finding open educational resources and using those in effective ways is going to be really important for your faculty as well. All right, our last question, the Daily Double. What does it take to make a MOOC? I would tell you it's going to take more than you think, but less than you fear. So it's a lot of effort, but it depends on your goals for a MOOC. What, what are you trying to achieve and what are you trying to do? People have been doing this kind of open sharing, learning, teaching for a really long time by simply setting up web pages with all their course content. Is that a MOOC? Um, are the comments at the bottom discussion? Is that a MOOC? That's not that hard. It's effort. It takes time. There's always that sort of seduction of just taping your lectures you have now. It'll be easy. You don't have to do anything. It's not that easy to make good learning exchange and good learning objects. I hate to learn, use the learning object term, but <laughs> to make a good learning experience. Um, so it does take some thought about what am I really trying to achieve? What would I like for people to walk away with? And then what's the best way to sort of get that content to them? Can I dump everything that I have on the web now? Can I, do I have to customize things? How much interaction do I want to have? So it will take more work and more thinking about your teaching than you've done before, probably. It was for me when I first went online. But honestly, less effort than I thought. It wasn't as bad, wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. So I'm not going to give you a very concrete answer because I think what you end up making very much determines what goes into it, of course. But I would say that a really important thing to put into a MOOC is a whole, whole lot of planning. And the planning has to start with what are you trying to achieve? What are, you, what are your goals? And who is your audience? I think those are two of the most important questions. They're integral to, uh, to instructional design and to course design anyway, but a lot of times we kind of start with the syllabus and then go from there. I think we should always start with the questions. What are we wanting students to be able to do in this course, to be able to achieve in this course? And um, how are we going to help students get there? And who are these students in the first place? Are we targeting university students to let them reuse resources? Are we targeting specific audiences to get a message out? All that really plays into the planning of a course. And then from there, the rest of the design then impacts what actually goes into the course itself. So uh, lots and lots and lots of planning and time. So there's been some uh, great thought-provoking answers, uh, many of them in the form of questions that are really helping us identify what are the key issues or how could you concisely um, explain them and raise the appropriate questions for different people on your campus. I uh, want to thank everybody for their time today and uh, certainly look forward to sharing these uh, views out through the community. So thank you very much. You know, it's interesting the diversity of opinion that we got within these answers. Yeah, we have the MOOC enthusiasts, the MOOC skeptics, and the MOOC curious. 
So now, I don't know which category you fall into, but whichever one it is, why don't you join in the conversation? Having listened to some of those comments, we'd like to hear what interests you and what your answer to one of these questions might be or what your next question might be.